sense control is one of the very essential aspects of any of the paths of self-realization. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna also deals with the topic. Actually, the topic is brought up by Arjuna himself, because in the second chapter, Arjuna puts a question to Lord Krishna. Stita pragnasyaka basha samadhi seva. Stita kim pravaseta kim asita prajeta kim. Arjuna is asking, what is the nature of one who has achieved transcendence? How does he speak and what is his language? How does he sit and how does he walk? So it's a very important question coming early on in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna wants to understand how to recognize a person who is actually transcendentally situated. And we're guided by the Acharyas like Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur in how to understand Arjuna's question. For example, when he says, how does he speak and what is his language? He doesn't mean, is he speaking Bengali or Hindi or English? You know, he wants to know more, is he speaking with authority? Is he speaking in a proper manner? Is he speaking or is it just some emotional display of language? Is he actually speaking from the heart? Is he speaking with compassion? Like this. And then how does he sit? Means how does he behave when he's not using his senses? And how does he walk means how does he act when he's using his senses. So it's important for us to understand how to use our senses in the service of Lord Krishna. <coughs> Devotional service. In the, the nectar of instruction, in the preface of that book, Srila Prabhupada writes that everything depends on the attitude of the disciple. The attitude, you have to have the right attitude. What should be our attitude in engaging in the service of Lord Krishna? Well, we could understand this in many different ways, actually. Attitude, it could, we could simply understand that it's important for us to appreciate the opportunity which is being given to us to serve the Supreme Personality of God, Lord Sri Krishna. It's something very special very rare, very valuable. And we should value every opportunity to engage in the service of Lord Krishna. That, that kind of attitude is important. We shouldn't take devotional service as something light. You know, sometimes, you know, at least I know when I was a student, I don't know about students today, but when I was a student, I remember one of the big problems in the college, in the uni, was apathy. That people are not, people are something apathetical to think. They think, ah, oh, don't, why worry about it? Don't even care about it. Don't think about it. 
they're apathetical. They just don't have interest in anything. So sometimes people are like that when it comes to japa in the morning. You know, oh yeah, we put our hands in the bead bag, you know, we hold the beads, you know. Let me find something to, you know. We don't take the, the japa very seriously. We allow our apathy to interfere, be become laid back. We think this is my time to space out. We don't understand the importance of japa and how it's very important time in the day. It's a time when we can actually conquer our mind and get to terms with our mind which is very important if we're going to control the senses. The mind is the reins and the senses are the horses. The driver is the intelligence. But the senses, the mind and the intelligence can all be influenced by lust, as we will hear in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. They can all be contaminated by lust. Lust means the desire to enjoy ourselves independently of the Supreme Lord. We simply think of our pleasure, my pleasure, what's in it for me. That is the idea of lust. So that contamination is spread through the subtle body. The senses, the mind and ego, they're influenced by that kind of contamination. And then we have to deal with the senses. And the senses are like wild horses. The example is very appropriate wild horses on a chariot. Anybody who's ever ridden a horse, you know what it's like. If it's a young, strong horse, you know, it's not an easy thing to control. They're very powerful. And they have a lot of energy. Our senses are like that, very difficult to restrain them. And of all the senses, of course, we know the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur has made it very clear to us in his wonderful prayer, a prayer which we learn first before any other prayer. Right? Somehow we learn that prayer very quickly. <laughs> Some devotees call that prayer the wake up prayer. And when we say Om Namo Bhagavate, that's to go to sleep. <laughs> so that's the nature of the mind. We take things in that way. We take them lightly. We don't take it very seriously. We have to understand the nature of the mind, that it is really difficult to control. But it's possible. You have to make friends, train the mind, right? Training the, the mind. Uh, Sometimes we describe the uncontrolled mind like the wild animal. If you have a wild animal, maybe you have a tiger, or a mount, a lion or something, you want to train it, there's a technique. They will put it in the cage and starve it. And then they will beat it and then they will feed it. 
So in this way, the lion learns. This person, very powerful. Animals also have intelligence. Sometimes people don't realize this. They think animals are just, you know, they're just like machines and they have no talent, no feeling. But animals are, you can see the cows. You can see our cows here. The, what is the feel of the cows? You just go and just by being in the presence of the cows, you can feel their gentleness and you can feel their goodness. Although the cow is an animal, but still there's so much goodness from them. And you can see their behavior, how they're so gentle and you know, and how they're, they, they're kind to each other, they relate to each other in a friendly manner. And so you get some animals which are of a different nature, wild animals, just like the mind. The mind can be the friend, the mind can be the enemy. We say, just like a knife. You can, the doctor can use the knife to heal, but the villain will use the knife to kill someone. It's the same knife, but it's been used in different ways. In the same way, the mind can elevate us and the mind can degrade us. How are we going to use it? We have to therefore learn in the beginning to conquer over the mind. I was quoting one of my god brothers yesterday morning, I think I said about how we're training our gladiators to conquer the mind in the arena of Japa. Then that is real Japa. If you enter into the Japa in that mood, that this is the arena where I'm going to conquer my mind then you can really enter into some good japa and you can purify your, your consciousness and you can get to grips with your mind because it, it is difficult to control the mind. Sense control is not easy. We are learning the process of sense control in a very gentle manner, a very nice manner. You know, if you look at the, the Buddhists or the Mayabadis or even other Sampradayas sometimes, some of the austerities which they go through in order to control their senses and mind. Just like, uh, you know, our tilak, we simply put on some gopi chanda. But in the Sri Vaishnavas, they have that brass metal and they burn into the skin. They burn it, actually burn the symbol of Vishnu into the skin. So Jiva Goswami said that that is not the mode of goodness, that kind of protection. We simply put on gopi chanda. It's much easier. <laughs> It's not so uh, challenging as actually putting some red hot brass onto your arm to burn the skin, to put the symbol of Lord Vishnu there. And then also, Buddhists, for example, in Buddhism, they, to control their senses, they have very strict rules. One of the rules is nothing, you don't eat anything after midday. You only eat two meals a day. They eat breakfast and they can eat something before midday. Now, sometimes when I'm entering into a country like Thailand, which is a Buddhist country, you know, I go through the immigration. If I'm dressed in my robes as a monk, they will look at me and they will say, have you got a watch on? No, no, I don't have a watch. They say, oh, okay. Because if you have a watch on, you're not a monk. 
they have a rule like that. You can have a handphone, <laughs> but no wristwatch. You can even have a pocket watch, but no wristwatch. <laughs> Funny rules, isn't it? <laughs> They have, they have all these rules. Sometimes, even they told me in Buddhism, sometimes they sit and they recite all the rules which they're supposed to follow. There are many, many rules and hardly they can follow any. <laughs> I was doing book distribution there in Thailand one time and someone asked me, how many rules do you have? I said four. They said, oh, only four? <laughs> In Buddhism, we have, there's hundreds. They spend the whole day sitting, reciting all the rules. When you smile, don't, throw, don't show your teeth. <laughs> things, things like this, you know, they have some really funny rules. And don't look at, well, if you're a young man, there's a, you don't look at the woman. What do you do? You look down. That's a good rule. Something you can apply. <laughs> the, the young men, <laughs> young men may be attracted to look at the young women. So if you're disturbed, just look down. The young monks are all trained to look down. So... Like that, there are rules. Uh, the Madhvas, the Madhvacharya line, our line also comes through Madhva. Uh, if you, there's a Sanskrit college in Bangalore, and they have a, all the young men, they go there, study Sanskrit between age of 12 and 22. And it, it's free education. They study Sanskrit, they study you know, all the teachings of Madhvacharya and how to defeat impersonalism and everything. And so they have the rule on Ekadasi, no prasada. Full fasting on Ekadasi. So they have that kind of rule. You know? Prabhupada's so merciful. You see? Prabhupada had a, he's a, he made an Ekadasi feast. <laughs> For the team because he thought, you know, fasting very difficult for <laughs> new devotees. So get them attached to prasada. And so it made a nice feast for everyone on the cottage. How merciful Srila Prabhupada and the Krishna consciousness movement is. You see, other, other systems, the process of sense control is very extreme, and very demanding. But in Krishna consciousness, the process of sense control comes natural. It comes naturally by simply engaging in Krishna's service. We see the wonderful example of Maharaj Ambarish. Now Maharaj Ambarish was a king. Actually, he was a ruler of the world in a huge empire. But he was not a materialistic enjoyer, as we would think a king would be. He was a great devotee. And Srimad Bhagavatam tells us how he used all of his senses. He engaged all of his senses in the service of the Lord. Right? You all probably you all know that first verse. Sabainmana Krishna Dara Binde Vachamsi Vaikunta Gunanda Varnani Kalo Hare Mandira Marjana Dishu Shrutara Chakra Jutta Chakato Right? This this way the Maharaj Ambarish is using his different senses. But the very first thing he did was to fix his mind on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. This is very important to bring the mind onto Krishna. We have to start right. 
get it right in the beginning. You start, get off to a good start. It's so important in everything we do, right? We want to get a good start. You know, you want to get a good start to the day. You know, watch out for Rahu Kala. I don't want to leave. I've got to get out before Rahu Kala begins, you know, things like this, you know. But in Krishna consciousness, we simply want, the good start means simply bring the mind to Krishna. Think of the lotus feet of Krishna. How to think of Krishna's lotus feet? Well, you can go and see the deity and look. You can see the Lord's lotus feet. You can observe your mind in them. In Mayapur, in Sridhar Mayapur, we have the lotus footprints of each of the deities along the front of the altar. And you can see the different markings which are there on the lotus feet of the Lord. Just like on Lord Krishna's lotus feet, there are markings like that, uh, that gourd, for, which is used for c controlling elephants. So the mind is like that. It's like a stubborn elephant. You have to use that sharp object, you know, you see the elephant keepers, they carry that metal object, they would stick it in the elephant, and that way the elephant, oh, mm -hmm. the elephant, you know, gets the message, he's got to do what he's told. So the same way that mark said on Lord Krishna's lotus feet. And you think of Lord Krishna's lotus feet, it con conquers the mind, which is like the stubborn elephant. Another symbol on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna is the thunderbolt. Thunderbolt shatters the mountain. There's a mountain of sin in our hearts. And the thunderbolt weapon can shatter that mountain of sin. And remove it all. Remembering the lotus feet of Lord Krishna will destroy all of the sin from the past. This is the power of taking shelter of Lord Krishna's lotus feet. So Maharaj Ambarish is showing us how to use the senses. Fix the mind first on the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and then Savaimana Krishna Parara Vindaya Vachamsi Vaikuntha Gunana. Recite the topics of the spiritual world. Describe the glories of the kingdom of God. Use the tongue. In other words, use the tongue to vibrate the transcendental activities of Lord Krishna and to describe the kingdom of God. Like, don't allow the mind to reflect on the mundane, on the material. The mind is, we say, how did Arjuna describe it? Chanchala hi More difficult to control than the wind, Arjuna said. Yes, but what did Krishna say? Asamshaya Mahabharu Abhyasena Tukontiya this, this, At lunchtime today we were hearing uh, His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu describe about Abhyas and Vairat, right? Those two things how important they are. We need to practice and we also need detachment. That is also important. We have to practice, it's very important. We practice daily and not just once a day. We practice in the morning, we practice again at night and we should be practicing constantly, practically every moment. 
bringing the mind away from Maya, bringing it back to Krishna. Wherever the mind may wander due to its restless and unsteady nature, bring it back and fix it on Lord Krishna. And how to bring it back? Simply by chanting the holy name. This is our process. We give every all importance to the chanting of the holy name. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said, Kirtane Asadahari, always chant the holy name. You may not be chanting on your beads, but still you can be chanting. And if you're not chanting the holy name, we should be using the tongue to, dis to describe the glories of Lord Krishna, to speak about Lord Krishna, his wonderful qualities and his pastimes, or his energies, his potencies. In this way, we have to utilize our mind and senses to glorify Krishna. This is how we control the senses. If we don't control the senses, what happens? Bhagavad Gita describes different stages of fall down. Jayato vishayam pumsa. Sangat Kama Roda Smriti Vibrama, Smriti Ramshat Vibhinasho, Udhinashat Pranashat. You don't fall down, huh? You never fall down. You don't need to know that. So, Jayato Vishayampu, by contemplating the objects of the senses, a person becomes attached to them. The point is, if the mind is not being used to think of Krishna, to hear about Krishna, to chant the glories of Krishna, the mind will simply wander into Maya. It will go to Maya. We have that habit. We are conditioned souls. We do have that nature. And we've had that nature for a long time. We're here in this material world. We want to get out. We have to make an effort. It won't, it doesn't come easy. We have to make some effort to control the mind. Don't let the mind remain thinking of the objects of the senses. We contemplate about sense gratification. Oh, there's a sweet shop. Oh, they've got, oh, there's Casey Das. Oh, his Golobjamans are really famous, right? <laughs> Prabhupada even spoke about Casey Das and his Golobjamans <laughs> or his Rasgulas. The Rasgulas, that's it, not Golobjamans, Rasgulas. Casey Das and his Rasgulas. I want to enjoy some Rasgulas. The mind will reflect on that. Yeah. You're all thinking now about rascals and robotjamans. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to understand we, we don't take anything which is not offered to Krishna. Right? You cannot just walk past the, the, the sweet shop and offer all the sweets. <laughs> That's not proper offering, right? That's not the system. We want to offer to Krishna, you purchase some, you bring it home, you offer on the altar, and you say, we don't, you know, sometimes the devotees would do that. They go past the ice cream factory, offer up all the ice cream, you know. <laughs> oh, let's have some ice cream. No. The mind does reflect on these things, the objects of the senses, the tongue, that voracious pulsating object which we have there in the mouth. It likes 
to taste, likes to taste, right? They, we have that ruchi. We have the taste for these things. We don't have the taste for the, we don't have the nama ruchi, but we have the mitai ruchi, right? <laughs> we have that taste. We have, we have to train our mind and senses, train the mind for cultivating the higher taste, the higher taste, right? That Param Drisva. And we were hearing there's a Param Drisva, not just the higher taste, but the Param Drisva, the supreme taste. And that is the taste of Krishna consciousness. We want to cultivate that kind of taste. So it comes about with practice, abhyasi nyotpontiya and vairagya, detachment. We have to let go. We have to let go of everything. Don't hold on. There's a story, the, the Buddhists often tell this story about how the one man came to his Buddhist master and said, Master, how can I give up my attachment? How can I ever get free of all my attachments? So the master said, just wait a little while and I will tell you. So later that day, the disciple heard this guru calling out, help, help, save me, save me. So the disciple went running and he found his guru and he was holding a tree. He had his arms around the tree and he was shouting, help, let me go, let me go. <laughs> yeah, the disciple looked at his master and said, Guruji, you just have to let go. You're holding the tree. So then the master turned and he looked at his disciples and said, yes, you want to get free of your attachments? You just have to let go. So in Krishna consciousness, it's a little different. We don't just let go, but what we do is we hold on to Krishna. We hold on to Krishna. We don't want to just let go because then you're adrift. You have no anchor. You, you could just go anywhere. We heard the boat on the sea, and the big waves come, you know. The, we, I was in, there was a tsunami some years ago. I don't know if you remember that. Do you remember? Yeah. There was a big tsunami in, and it hit the whole coastline, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia. It was huge, very big, so many people died. So it happened, there was a police launch, a police launch, it was a big, powerful motorboat. And it, the tsunami came, it carried the police launch two miles inside, inshore. It was, it's two miles away from the beach. They've left the boat where it is. Commemoration of that tsunami. The boat's still there. It's two miles from the shore. The tsunami was so great that this huge launch got carried all the way in two miles. I mean, it gives you some idea the power of the sea. You know, when something like a tsunami comes, you don't want to be around. You, you, you don't have a chance. So the mind, controlling the mind, like it's also difficult to control the mind. But if we hold on to Krishna, if we take shelter of Lord Krishna, then that is the real shelter from all the influences of the material energy. We have to train our mind and bring it to remember Krishna, to think of Krishna. If you don't know anything about Krishna, then it's difficult. 
if you never hear about Krishna, then it will be difficult for you to remember Krishna. It's important for us that we have to read Prabhupada's books and we have to hear regularly about Lord Krishna. And in this way, gradually, we start to remember that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Lord and I am one of his tiny servants. So please let me engage in his service. And immediately you chant, call out the holy name, Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! 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 Hare Hare! Good. No room for Maya, right? <laughs> when we are chanting loudly the holy name, there's no possibility of Maya catching us. So this is how we get rid of Maya. We're in Maya. You don't have to be in Maya. You just have to hold on to Krishna. Let go of the Maya and hold Krishna. Take shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. And in this way, we can avoid all the obstacles, all the miseries, all the problems of material life. Every, all the problems are coming due to one reason, forgetfulness of Lord Krishna. Because we've forgotten Krishna since time immemorial, we have been meeting so many miseries of life. We want to get rid of the miseries, simply hold on to Krishna, take shelter of Lord Krishna, chant his name, read the Bhagavad Gita, Srimad ba read the, the scriptures, come and see the deities and pray, offer prayers to the deities and join the kirtan and chant and dance in ecstasy of love of God. This is the seek, this is the process. It's a, it's a process. It's a science. This is a great science, a science which frees us from all of the miseries, all of the problems of life. We just have to engage. We just have to take part in these activities. And so long as you stay engaged in these activities, you'll see you're safe. You have no problems. As soon as you go away, Maya comes. <laughs> Maya's always there. As soon as we put out the light, immediately the darkness comes. But stay in the light. Tamasima Jyotir Kama. Stay in the light. Don't go to the dark. Stay in the light. Krishna Surya Sama. Yahan Krishna Thanahi. Yes, Krishna is the sun. Maya is the darkness. Don't go in Maya. Darkness means illusion. Ignorance, forgetfulness of Krishna. We want to hold tightly to Lord Krishna. That is the process of sense control, using our senses for the service of Krishna. Whatever you do, you can do it for Krishna. Of course, there's some, some with some discrimination. Not everything, but... <laughs> But generally, whatever we want to do, we should want to do it as an offering or for the pleasure of Lord Krishna. We use our senses. We don't say, stop all the, you know, the other, the, the Buddhists say, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. We don't say like that. See Krishna. See the deities. Hear the holy name and chant the glories of the Lord. Chant the songs and the 
the hymns and the slokas glorifying Lord Krishna. We use our senses. We don't deny the senses. These other processes are artificial, denying the senses. We want to use everything. Rupa Goswami said, Nirbanda Krishna, Yukta Vairagya Uchati. Right? That, that is actually renunciation. You, using everything for the service of Krishna. Prabhupada talks about how the famous, famous man in Bengal, he had a picture taken, money on the table, and he's going, so I, he wouldn't touch the money. People thought, oh, he's a great sadhu. He would not touch money. Prabhupada said, there was so much money under the table. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, they can give the money to me. I can count it better than the bank teller. And I'll spend it all for Krishna. So we're not afraid of money. We use it for the service of Lord Krishna. Right? We don't run away from the material energy. Rather, we know how to spiritualize the material energy by bringing it into the service of Krishna. That there was a, they, they did a program in the college one time. They put up notice, come and see matter made into spirit. Oh, the students were going, wow, that sounds really good. We've got to go to that. Come and see matter made into spirit. So the, the program came, a lot of students all came, they all wanted to see this. So the devotees had prepared a lot of prasadam and they had an altar and they brought the plate on and put it on the altar, they drew the curtains and they, they made the offering. <laughs> then they opened the curtain and said, now it's all spiritual. This food is all spiritual. And they distribute the prasada for you. So we know how to utilize the material energy, how to, how to spiritualize it by using it in the service of Lord Krishna. We're not afraid of matter because for the devotee, it's all Krishna's energy. The devotee doesn't run away from the material world. We don't go and hide in the mountains or go in a cave. I met one young man, he told me he went into the cave, he stayed in a cave for a month. He said after a month he had more material desires than he ever had. <laughs> so you just go in a cave, that's not the answer. Yeah. So we have to know how to deal with the material energy. We don't go away from the world. We can live in the cities and preach and be Krishna conscious. This is our business as devotees. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada built temples in the cities. Bhakti Vinod Thakur was preaching in the villages because the time of Bhakti Vinod Thakur was different. It's much more, uh, much more rural society. People were more in the countryside. But by the time Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati's Gaudiya Mat, the, there was more industrialization and people were coming more to the city. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati was preaching as well as in the, the holy places in some villages, but more in the towns and cities, even down to Chennai and places like that. He established the Gaudiya Mark. And then Srila Prabhupada took the holy name all over the world. So we're, we don't limit the message of Krishna. It's everywhere. Go everywhere to give Krishna consciousness. Devotees of Krishna are everywhere. Krishna's in every, every living entity's heart. We have to give them the, the chance to become 
Krishna conscious. This is our business as devotees. Okay, are there any questions? Anybody has any trouble controlling their senses? Yes, yes, Prabhu. You have you have trouble controlling your senses? Hare <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> Yes. Hello. Oh, no, 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 no. Ma Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's followers, many were in the family life. Lord Nityananda was in family life. And Advaita Acharya was in family life. Uh, Shivananda Sen was in family life. Well, the, the teaching of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is that he encouraged people stay in whatever position you are in. You don't have to change your position to become Krishna conscious. And he quotes, he, he quotes a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, which was spoken by Lord Brahma when he was offering prayers to Lord Krishna. And Lord Brahma said, Stane stita shuti gatan tan vangmanobir ye prayaso jita jitopi asita istrilo. He said, Stane stita, you stay in whatever position you're in. If you're brahmachari, stay brahmachari. Okay? <laughs> But what is your duty? Okay. Your duty is to deliver your family. Right? Your duty is not just to feed the family. Of course, that's there. But you have a duty to deliver the family. Don't become a husband unless you can deliver your wife. Don't become a parent unless you can deliver your children. Deliver them means not just simply deliver them to IIT or NIT, <laughs> but deliver them from birth and death. <laughs> if you don't deliver your family from birth and death, then you failed in your duty. That is the real duty. To deliver people from birth and death. So this is Krishna consciousness. Of course, other duties are also there, but that's they're included. First, the most and understand the most important duty. To get people to get people free from birth and death. That they should get out of this world. They should become liberated out of the material world. No, I didn't say abandon anything. I said stay in whatever position you're in. You stay in whatever position you're in. But you have to hear about Krishna in the association of devotees. That is important. You know, many of our people here, they also have jobs. They're also working people. They also, we also have most of our members are family people. They're fam they have their families, they have their children. But they take time to come here 
and or if they don't come here then they do it on their own at home and they meet together with their friends and they chant Hare Krishna, they worship Krishna and they discuss this, this Bhagavad Gita, they discuss the teachings of Lord Krishna. Are you ready? You can. <laughs> you should join. You should join. You also, you know, you don't have to leave anything. Stay wherever you are, whatever position you're in, but add Krishna consciousness into your daily routine. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, I had one question. Like, you know, when we say that uh, whatever uh, activities we do in this world, so we are either suffering in hell or we go to the heaven. And now, like in the Vedic system, we have the concept of Sanskrit Karma and Sarada Karma. So, my question was that if we suffer for our you know, bad deeds in hell and suffer for good deeds in heaven, so then how do the karmas add a factor? Because for every birth, you know, every birth, like in this birth, I am performing something bad, I am suffering in hell. Or if I do something good for that, I am being sent to the heavens. So whatever bad or good activities I am doing in this life, for that I am I being punished in hell or compensated in heaven. Then how do the karmas come into the next life? Or how do they accumulate? Then how the question of Sanskrit karma comes in? What karma? <laughs> Accumulated karma. You have to understand the power of devotional service. The devotional service destroys all the karma, all of the karma. There's different phases of karma. We have parabdha karma and aparabdha karma. And then there's bija karma and there's also kuta. And there's different stages of desire seeds. There's kuta, bija, parabdha, aparabdha. But bhakti yoga is so powerful, it destroys all of these phases of karma. So suppose that karma accumulates, suppose the person is not doing bhakti yoga, but if he dies, uh, you know, he's going to, he's going to heaven and uh, getting rewarded for his deeds, and he's also going to hell, uh, suffering for his bad deeds. And how does karma accumulate? Because he's extinguishing the karma, going to heaven and hell. Then how do karma accumulate? Well, you go to the higher planets, you use up your good karma. And when you use up your good karma, then you come back here. When you come back here, then you engage in... This is the karma, karma shetra. This is the field of karma. This is where you're earning the karma on this planet, Earth. So you're getting your karma. Some You do some bad things, you go down. You do some good things, you go up. Yeah, you use up the karma. You go into hell, you suffer there, use up the bad karma. When the ka gradually the karma is exhausting, you come back here. Yeah, so if my karma is exhausted in hell, then why is somebody born a poor person or a, you know, a diseased person? You know, then we have already been punished in hell. Then why do we suffer in the well, next that world? is their hell. That is their hell. That disease, okay. that okay. is their hell. Not everybody actually goes down to hell. Some people they'll get the suffering on this planet, okay. and then they're put. They get some disease like that. That is their karma. Fine. Okay. And somebody's very rich. That's their good karma. Somebody's poor. That's their karma. Uh, Maharaj, what I want to ask: My bad deeds in this life can that be nullified the effects of my bad deeds? See. Can you hear me properly? No. I, am I audible? No. The effects of my bad deeds, evil deeds in this life, can they be nullified? Yes, they can be nullified. Oh, how? By bhakti yoga, simply by chanting Hare Krishna mantra without offense. You have to chant the Hare Krishna mantra without offense and you have to cultivate the bhava, the love, the praying for Krishna, that will destroy all of your karma. That is how you can get rid of all your karma. By engaging in any of the activities of devotional service. Just simply by hearing, by being here tonight and hearing, you're getting rid of a lot of karma. <laughs>
Let's so, see. So you come here regularly and you get rid of all of your karma. <laughs> but of course you have to stop doing bad karma. <laughs> what is bad karma? You have to understand what are the what is why do you get karma? Because we engage in sinful activities. Meat eating, intoxicate meat or fish. Bengalis, they like fish a lot. <laughs> so no fish, no meat, no egg even, no onion, no garlic. And because that there that's a there's a onion and garlic are aphrodisiac. They increase the passion, they stimulate the lust in the body. So we already have a lot of that in the body. We, we want to get rid of it. We don't help by eating more. So no onion and garlic, no meat, fish and egg, no intoxication, meaning no beaties, no pan, no, no chai. <laughs> We have, we have to follow these rules, a basic rule. We get karma, we get sins because we don't follow these kind of rules. When you take some intoxicant, then you get, you're doing more sinful activities. So no meat, no intoxication, no gambling, and no illicit sex. People can be married, you can have a family. We, we, we don't tell people no sex. We say no illicit sex. You want to have a, a wife? By all means, get married and have a wife and raise a family. And raise them in God consciousness. So that way you get rid of all your karma. We have got karma from many lives, but it can all be destroyed by bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga be begins with hearing. And then you hear and then you chant. You have to get some beads, you have to chant. Just like I have a bag, we are all having bags, you see. And in our bag we have our beads and we sit, we chant every day. Have you got beads? You got a mala? Oh, you have to get one mala. We, we have a shop there, you know, you can go. And, and you can get the bag also. And you begin chanting and you do it every day. And you'll feel the benefit. You'll feel the spiritual energy awaken. Guaranteed. You just try it. Just try it for one month. Follow those rules. Chant every day. You'll see the change. Yes? Any other question? Yes? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Maharaj. So there is a personality uh, who is uh, doing uh, a project, Save Soil project, you know him. And he he has, he is doing that project for 100 days, riding 30, 30, 30 kilometers on bike. In a recent survey, it was observed that around 2.5 to 3 billion people are following him. So my question is that, uh, what is there in that personality that people are accepting more frequently than preachers like you, like this Prabhu asked you some questions, but they are not 100% accepting your words. At the same time, for that, for that personality, people just accept his words frequently. So what is that, uh, that uh, keep these people away from accepting our uh, iskon words? Bhavad Gita words. Yes. Well, we have to understand that in the material world, most people are not educated to understand what is the real goal of life. They're, they can be attracted by some magical power or some. Uh, very charismatic person. They're simply attracted by some external feature 
of the material energy. They're not actually serious in accepting the path of self-realization. For example, if you tell people, oh, you just, you just, uh, you can eat everything. We don't have any, uh, we don't have any rules or anything. You just have to pay the money and you can become my follower. Then you can get a lot of followers like that, you know. And if you're going to tell people you can become God, then you may get also a lot of followers. I don't know exactly who this person is or what he's claiming, but the Prabhupada said the cheaters will find that the, 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 the cheat, the, there's two classes, there's the cheaters and the cheated. So the, the many people want to be cheated. They're looking for something, they want to be cheated. They actually, is, they're, they're easily cheated. And if, they're, if they can get everything very easily, very cheaply, then you get a lot of followers. But it, you don't judge the, the morality, you don't judge the spiritual position of a person by just how many followers he has. Now somebody may be a very great teacher, he may not have any followers, but he may be a very good, very pure, very strict and very powerful teacher. He just, he, sometimes somebody just doesn't want to have followers. And somebody else, as you described, he has so many followers, a billion followers, a million followers, but he may be teaching some nonsense. But people just follow him. Why? Oh, so many people are following him. I should also follow. The blind follow the blind. <laughs> so, like that, that's why you have somebody with a lot of followers. But what is the result? What kind of result do they get? Are they in control of their senses? Are they, are they learning the science of God? Are they getting free of their karma? You have to consider. You have to look at the actual spiritual position. Who is actually following the principles of religion and who is not? You don't just judge by how many followers somebody has. Who is actually speaking according to Shastra and instructing people according to Shastra? And who is just speaking their own philosophy, their own ideas, their own speculation? So they say in the Kali Yuga, what is real religion will be known as irreligion. And irreligion will become religion. So don't be misled. We want to understand what is the success of our Krishna consciousness movement. Well, the success of the Krishna Consciousness Movement is that the Holy Name is being chanted. The Holy Name is being distributed. And also books are being printed and distributed in many languages as well. Centers are being opened. <laughs> we don't just go to countries which are wealthy. We go everywhere. The devotees are going to every town and village. They're trying to go everywhere to distribute Krishna consciousness. We don't just pick, you know, a rich country. Oh, oh that's a rich country. There's a lot of money there. I should go there, preach there. You know, sometimes people think, well, it'd be nice to go to Hawaii. 
Hawaii is a nice climate, you know, heavenly. I think it'd be good to go to Hawaii and preach. So we preach in Hawaii, but we don't only preach in Hawaii. We preach in Calcutta also. It's a bit different from Hawaii. But we have a lot of preaching there. So a devotee is thinking, where to do, where are their people? Where are their souls? Wherever the souls are, we want to go there and give them the holy name. So Krishna consciousness is being distributed. One place I go in Russia, there's one place I go to in Russia. It's extreme far east Russia. That means come from Moscow and you go for about 10, 12 hours, you'll come to Siberia. So you keep going through Siberia, keep going. And then after some time, then you come to Vladivostok. And then Vladivostok, then it's another three hours in the flight. And you get to this one city. And there's no road. There's no way you can go by road to get to this town. It's not a city, it's a town. But it's a town, very remote region of Russia. And you know, it's so cold. They have about two months where it's a little warm. Maybe in the, it's about 12 degrees or 15 degrees for two months. The rest of the year, minus many minus 30, minus 40, quite cold, you know. <laughs> and uh, there's not much to eat there also, you know, that they don't grow a lot of food there because the climate doesn't allow it. But somehow people are living there. There's a town there and we have a temple there. <laughs> they they call that area the land of the bears. Just like we have dogs in the street, they have bears. There are bears running around. Not big bears, little bears, you know. <laughs> but they're bears. <laughs> Mummy bears probably big, you know. <laughs> The big bears, are, they don't come in the town, but the small bears. Anyway, that's the idea, our preaching. You'd say we're not preach. our Krishna consciousness movement is not being spread. It's, you can go these places, it's so remote. You have to go by flight, it's so far away. But we're preaching there, distributing books. We have the Govinda restaurant. We have prasadam distribution, we have devotees, and you can go to Africa. There are places in Africa where the devotees are preaching. Everywhere devotees are going. We don't think, oh no, I don't want to go there. It's like, you know, China, you want to go to China, you know what they say about China? They say China will eat anything which flies in the air, <laughs> anything which moves on the land, and anything in the sea. But we have many Chinese devotees also. We're preaching there also. We have nice Chinese devotee, they become the nice vegetarian. Oh, no. The devotees of Krishna are everywhere. We have to go. Jarakant, we have many devotees there. There's a beautiful uh, Kanai Natsawa is in Jarakant. Wonderful temple, very nice. But it's not easy. 
They make a you know they they have a they had the guest house there Jar Kamaina Sala. They made the guest house. They woke up in one morning, all the furniture was gone. <laughs> they took everything out of every guest room. <laughs> People come in the night, you know, with the boat because we're right beside the Ganga. So they come in the boat and they just took everything from the guest house. All the guest rooms woke up in the morning, no more fun. It's difficult, you know, sometimes. Some places are quite difficult to preach, like Africa. <laughs> it's not easy preaching. Prabhupada went to Africa and uh, they washed his cloth. And then when they went to get Prabhupada's cloth, they, and Prabhupada's cloth, his cloth is gone. Where's, where's Prabhupada's cloth? They couldn't find Prabhupada's cloth. Then that night they had a program. One devotee came, Prabhupada's Kurtar. Another devotee got Prabhupada's do, do, Doti. <laughs> all the devotees, they all took different pieces of Prabhupada's <laughs> But we have to go there, we have to preach. Prabhupada saw, saw devotee, they sent a devotee to Africa. He went there, he saw the devotee was only preaching to the Indians. He said, I send you to Africa, I preach to the Africans. He said, oh, Prabhupada. <laughs> but Prabhupada arranged a big program. Jai, Gorni Tai Ki. Prabhupada arranged a big program and he went to the African villages and he preached to all the African people and got them all chanting and dancing. And Prabhupada told the devotees, you have to preach to the African people. We don't discriminate who is qualified and who is not. We see Krishna in everybody's heart. So this is Krishna conscious. Okay, Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada ki. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.